to the borders, Vermonters come down with your breeches of deer skin and jackets of brown. With your red woolen caps and your moccasins come to the gathering summons of Trump. Mr. Fullerton's chat talk about tools. He calls it extension of the hand. Every tool has a story. And uh, he's going to show us things that he's brought. But if you have anything you brought and would like to ask him about it or have something explained, I'm sure he'll be happy to do that. So thank you very much for coming. And now Boy, I never dreamed I'd end up here. I'm just a little old country boy. I was brought up about three miles from here, the other side of Long Hill. I traveled about 10 miles to get here by road. My <laughs> kind of interesting, a lot of ancestors lived around here. What's his name? Can't think of his name. Uh, Fred Bloods called him back pasture relatives. And uh, I was brought up on a little dairy farm, typical way back in. I was brought up in the 30s and 40s, and then there were little farms all over the hillsides. And typically, we'd have a family of three kids, five, up to ten kids, all living as a little group together to make a living. Sometimes a hired man mixed in. And uh, I remember, there's so much to say about it, but I remember you get up in the morning in the summer, the sun coming up, you'd hear a rooster crowing. About four o'clock in the afternoon, I'd hear the Bridgewater whistle, that musical sound echoing off the hills. The fellow pulled the rope when he blew the whistle at the mill. And when I worked in, I worked in a mill out in New York, and there was an old World War II veteran that was a head fireman. And he'd say, oh, and he says, I put a tail on it. He pulled it down, he let up very slow, and then, then it'd ring and let up. Little things like that, you can't help but remember. And in the evening, when the sun went down, you'd hear the chimney swifts. Chimney swifts and the, that's the other one, all around the sky. I don't see them much anymore. But my family's, I've got ancestors all over the place. And uh, for instance, Old Charlie Lincoln bought the Lincoln Place by Lincoln Bridge, 1858, I think. 1868, the bridge went out. Well, they put another one in. It's still there. It didn't wash help, but they're beating it up now. How many people here were brought up in a country where you... Come on, there ought to be a lot of you. <laughs> not, not too many of us left. <laughs> well, we had... Horses for power, we had dairy cattle for some milk check, we had hogs, remember the hogs? They had some nice smoked bacon, home smoke, with cobs. They were at obvious disposal. And then we had cats, we had dogs and cats and mice and rats. <laughs> we, had, we had vegetables, fruit, all kinds of apples. So we had organic food then. <laughs> we had well, I think. And well, my ancestors, I mentioned that. There was a Lincoln there, and his, it's interesting. My great, 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 whatever, grandfather bought it, and he had a bunch of children. One of them, his name was Newman. He was in the Civil War. And uh, Coffin. Coffin was giving a talk on TV the other day, and he talked about. What was the last one? I can't know. Uh, well, anyway, the battle was in. And my grandfather in his memoirs tells about he was on picket duty. And he didn't know whether it was Hall or somebody else that fired the same shot. That was Battle Cedar Creek. And uh, I guess he really was in it. But he came home. He had two boys. His wife died young. And uh, years went by. and. His son, Ora, my grandfather, married a lady brought up in North Bridgewater, the bunch of calm. There were four girls and two boys. And the boys went west. And my grandfather, Ora, married Jenny, and his father married Jenny's older sister. So my great-grandfather and grandfather married sisters. <laughs> and uh, then I live in South Woods. I live about now about three miles the other side of Long Hill. 
And if you, if you, well, I live where one other great grandfather lived, Carlos Adams. And I can throw an apple where, he's, where he lived and where my grandma was born. But you get on the road, when you live on Valley Road, you follow 10 poles up over a hill, you come to a, a T. John Dowling lived in Homestead. If you go three more poles to Captain Wood's place, and if you go down the ridge, they were on a Fulton saddle. They were all Revolutionary War vets. They were on a Fulton, uh, Gordon Tuttle, I don't know if he's here, he come off the info because he died interstate. And he was a shoemaker. He died interstate. He had no horse, buggy, ho but he had a lot of bills and potatoes and woodwork and uh, uh, shoemaker's tools. And uh, he died 39, left a wife of seven kids. But one of them, John Dolly, John Fullerton, married John Dowling's daughter, Mary, they called her Polly, like my wife. And Captain Wood's daughter, Mary Wood, married John, straight, John Dowling. John Dowling's daughter married John Fullerton. So those three were all revolutionary vets. <laughs> and they came from Marshfield, Pembroke, Massachusetts. Now, according to the Academy in South Woodstock, there are 37 Revolutionary War vets settled in Woodstock. And uh, Gladys Adams' book on Bridgewater, there are about that many from Bridgewater. That were. Well, getting back to tools. They help, them, help us tell the stories. Let's, let's pass that one around. Oh, my goodness. What are you talking about? One other little thing. The GI Bill took me out to the Empire State. And I lived on flat land out there. So over half my life. Does that mean I'm half flatlander? <laughs> <laughs> Things changed out there. I worked for a dairy, I run the milk plant, they had, 30, they had 63 Holsteins. The grandfather of John D, uh, Mr. Dickinson now has 2,500 cows. Things change everywhere you go. There must be someone in the crowd that can figure that one out. Takes a while to go around. <laughs> well, I had, well, look at that. I had a number of school teachers in my ancestry. There were <coughs> Isaiah Fullerton. He taught school. His wife, second wife, he lost his first wife. He hadn't had another family of six. He taught school. His wife taught school. She was from Cavendish. His oldest. His son, Erwin, taught school, Bridgewater Corners, I think 1890. His sister Susie taught in uh, number seven school, North Bridgewater. And uh, my great aunt Mary, who never married, she taught school for her whole life. And she taught Sunday school, I remember her. And she wrote up a lot of history of my ancestors. So, Yeah, it's it out. Take a long time. Oh, right? leave it to Alice. <laughs> <laughs> this girl can do anything. The teachers, <clears throat> I got one tool here, it has to do with school, but uh, the first story I heard about teachers was my great grandfather Adams was brought up. Not too far from here, 1840s, he was born, and his mother taught school in the cellar. The cellar hole's still there. And one little boy came in and she was complaining because he wasn't studying. And he says in a squeaky voice, he says, I didn't come to learn arithmetic, I came to trade roosters. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I don't think school teachers had too easy times. 
uh, when they got married, they couldn't teach anymore. Are there any teachers here? Are there anyone that ever went to a one-room school? One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, quite a few of you. Those who didn't know what they missed. Teachers weren't allowed to be married. Yeah. And teachers, that they were, in the later time when they did allow them to get married, if they got pregnant, then they were out the door. Well, why didn't they let them teach after they got married? What are the reasons? I don't know, but that lasted into the what, 50s. 50s, yeah, to my 40s and 50s. Yeah. To the 50s. My late yeah. mother-in-law, when she got married, her husband in the 30s, they had to stop teaching. Yeah. Well, the way the women had to work, you know, I look at how much Dad did and I worked with him with the horses. But you know, I have just as much respect for my mother. They knew how to operate an old stove, a wood, and this was still. I remember her, we go a while yet, you could hear her fixing the fire. You'd hear a little scrape, she'd enter the damper. Clump, she opened the back, bypass damper. And then you hear her squeak, she'd close the damper to the fire. And then you'd hear the griddle go slam, and then you'd hear her poke in the ashes. And there'd be a clunk as she fiddled for a stick of wood and put it in. And then you heard the cradle go down. Close the bypass. Adjusted the damper on the side. And then opened it. Yes, go ahead. When you mentioned the, the teachers, women didn't teach, you know, yes. they had to be single. Do you know what year that Changed. It changed. That was the early 1900s, wasn't it? No, no. Well, I, in, in 1931, my mother came to Bridgewater to teach, and I, I think, I mean, I heard that, and she was married in 32. So I wondered if, how, when that changed. Good question. If somebody here probably can answer it. Yeah. Well, you brought it up. Nine yeah. Nine. <laughs> <laughs> what year? Maybe it did change. Yeah. Well, when, I, when I was in school in the 1940s, um, all the women had to be single. They did it that late. Yeah, that late. And I know the one of them got married and she was gone, and then one of them, they allowed them in the late 40s to be married because of the war and so they could be married and but if they got pregnant they were out the door yeah. well that's interesting so and that was that was up until probably 19 um, 40, uh, seven. yeah 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 well that's when I was 47 yeah. I was out of school by then. Yeah. I was just a baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My mother didn't go back to teaching until we were grown. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that must have changed by different school districts. Because in 52, all my teachers were married, and they had been there a long time. Bessie Curtis, for instance, Mrs. Raymond, um, Mrs. Lewis. Um, they had they'd been teaching in Woodstock for a long time when I got there. Yeah, but that was the fifties, you said, right? Right, fifty-two. I was talking about the forties. Right, yeah. but if they they had to have been there, well into the forties. Must have been changing over. That's that's right. I went to one room school in South Woods in Fletcher District. Mrs. Copeland was a teacher. She was a twin, and she was married. I don't know if she had children. I went to Asheville in fifty. Four, I think it was, 54 or 55, we had sisters, Mrs. Bagley and Mrs. Lord. They were both married. Yeah. Is that Michael Bagley? Oh, yes. <laughs> my best teacher. She married my dad's first cousin. <laughs> <laughs> she was a teacher, I think. She was my best teacher. Yeah. Yeah. We'll discuss her sister the next year. <laughs> Is that tool going to run? Anybody figure that tool out? 
Alice did. Oh, I did. Oh, I thought you did. <laughs> some old time it must know what it is. Well, why is not an old timer, but it looks like some kind of a capper for something? A what? A capper for something. Capper? You might capper. call it that. I'm going to make it a nutcracker, but I don't, it doesn't, oh. stand. Oh. 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 Sounds like a peeling. Put the cork in the When it comes back, I can make it easier to understand it. It's a little confusing. <laughs> Yeah, I went to a one room school for six years. And uh, first year there were three of us. The second year the girl went ahead. And the third year the boy stayed behind. I was head of my class for three years. And then my mother thought I should go to Woodstock. It was the first year of junior high. They were still working on a building joining the senior and junior high and the younger high school. They had a new gym and two classrooms. And uh, now what was I going to say? Oh, well, there I had the honor of being the bottom of my class. <laughs> my mother had to teach me, so they let me go in the eighth grade. Well, how's that tool coming? <laughs> yes. <laughs> And the school is right in back of our house. And uh, so I used to be the uh, lady who, you know, checked the children in and checked them out and everything. And one day, one of the teacher's daughter got very, very sick. And they didn't know what to do, so they asked me if I would take over her class. And there were 40 kids in that class. I never had any trouble. <laughs> not a, not a piece. Pardon? How many? Boy. There were 40, uh, 40 kids in that classroom. Oh, they ever handled that many. <laughs> they were good kids. Anybody come up with an answer? Anybody here, huh? There we go. Do you have a reload? Yeah. How many reloaded? Thousands and thousands of rounds. <laughs> okay, this little gadget. It, 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 it screwed to a bench. Yeah. Yeah. And when you loaded your shotgun shells, yeah. this is the one with the paper shell, of course you take the primer out, put a new primer in, and then they made you up a little black powder and they put in a felt disc in it, press that in. And then they'd put shot. If it was a bird like partridge, they'd be small. If it's a deer, they call them buckshot, they might put in nine. And then they had a paper thing that fit in high and they push it down. And then they put it in this crazy tool. Thought I knew how to do it. And then they they put it in here so that the cartridge or the shell was in. And then they turned this crank and trim the paper edge, crimp it in to hold it so the shot wouldn't fall out. <laughs> you see come up once in a while. This, that was, this, I don't know, I could pick out jeepers. If we go way around, it takes a long time to identify it. What do you think? We just hold it up and see if we can identify yeah. it. It takes so long. Everyone see it? Go ahead, Dale. You probably know what it is. It's the knock the snow out of the shoes and the draft horses. They used to hang them on the, on the hames. Yeah, there you go. The other second, I saw from uh, two weeks ago, the first one ever told me that. That's where they hang them. So yeah, hang around on the hangs. Each horse had his own. In the wintertime, because they, they would snowball up between the shoe and the hoof, and they would skate, hit a, hit a floor or something, and skate right along. That would knock it out. Huh. Hmm. Oh, it's a good one. Snow longer. Now, when I was growing up, we had horses. I, <laughs> I think of a sled with a team and a temple tribal sled would hold a cord of wood. And uh, let's see. Anybody remember Howard Burns, Junior? Howard Burns, Senior? 
Okay, the old father was Bill Burns. They lived in South Woodstock opposite the Grange. I remember Dad saying, I think he was in his 80s. He could still plow a furrow with a straight, a straight furrow at that age. But they had a woodlot about, oh, I don't know, a third of a mile above where I lived. And they had figured, I think, 25 acres would grow enough wood to keep a farm in the wood for heating. I remember seeing them go down through the front of the house. Ear flappers down. See, he was holding the team going by with sat circles on his nose. Oh, <laughs> cold. I often think I was old timers, and he wasn't young anymore then. Okay, this one. Let's see. What, yeah, I got to tell about this. Some of us know what they were used for. Corn husk and pin. You got it. Wow. Is anybody? Yeah. yeah. Does anybody here go to a corn husk and bee? You got the one? I used to husk corn, yeah, but I never used one of those. You did? Okay. Okay. They, they, oh, I got a collection, a whole bunch of them, and they made them out of horn and out of old toothpaste, toothpaste and everything else. And, uh, okay, they put them on the finger like this. I went to a husking bee. Is that Howard Burns' place? The house is now gone. You take an ear of corn, and uh, when you come to husking bees, we sit around benches, they don't there bring the corn, they're husking corn then. It usually had eight rolls, they called it flit corn. And they'd harvest it in the field like this, and they'd dump it in the middle of the barn floor. And, uh, well, we'd sit down on, we didn't have any bale of hay then, the benches and buckets or whatever. And, uh, and when they'd have a bee, they'd get together and they'd get their corn, uh, they'd get their corn husk and they'd gossip and talk. And every, maybe 150 years, there'd be a red ear. Now this is where they'd husk it. Take your hand like this, put this right through here, put that down, take that the other way. Grab it like this, snap it, throw it in the basket. <laughs> over and over. And uh, we went out, came a trip out to out west, and we stopped in, I think, Iowa. And I bought a whole bag. And they used the gloves. And they're this, and that's... <laughs> and that would protect their head. And they would drive a team up the rows, and each man would take two rows, and they just grab them, drive and throw them. And uh, they had contests, and their literature, I belong, I joined their bang board, what they called it, about people who had them corn. And they had contests out there, and they quit in World War II. And they would go through a field for 80 minutes, and they would compete. And some of the ones that would do 30 or 40 bushel in 80 minutes. I can't imagine. <laughs> and the guy that won, those guys were like heroes, like someone that made the whole home runs. There's a story with everything. What about the, uh, what about when you were sitting around That's in the right. barn with, in a circle, husking corn? Oh, you're good, good you said that. Yeah. You know what, what I'm going to say, don't you? What about that red ear? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Howard Burns, I was a little shaver. I was in the, I just first went. And uh, Howard Burns saved all his, and he went around and kissed the girls afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> I got a red ear, and I wish I knew then what I do now. I was bashful. They had a girl picked out for me, and she wanted my piece of cake. <laughs> I took her here home with me. <laughs> but oh, they'd have more fun. But they got to work down the same time. This one here, uh, <laughs> there's a story with that you'll never guess, I don't think, but you might. What was that used for? What was, and what was it made for? Butter? 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 Butter?
It's got a shaper hole here. It's just like the panel that my dad used in the sugar house. Well, the story that goes, does anybody remember Dorothy Trudeau, Stillwell? Yeah, I do. She was born and brought up in Bridgewater. And then, no, 19... She was teaching school as a spare teacher at Fletcher for three weeks. And she lived with my great-grandfather and my grandmother for three weeks. And Grandpa Adams made her this pattern. And I was down visiting her. She lived on the South Road. And as she was a historian, she wrote some literature out for me. I stopped to visit her. And she came, this day, oh, and I want to show you something. And she came out from out back, and she comes out. She says, oh, and your great-grandfather made this for me, and I never had to use it. <laughs> and, uh, uh, well, anyway, later, after she died, I go by the house over and over. One day, there are a number of cars there, and I stopped. And I couldn't remember, couldn't forget the paddle. And her daughter, Judith, was there. I don't, never knew her. And I just happened there. She was there by a car, and I talked, and I asked her about the paddle. If she still had it, if I could buy it, and beg it, or whatever. I don't know, she said. And she disappeared in the house. Took quite a while, she came down and gave it to me. <laughs> but Dorothy Trudeau, she was a school teacher. She spoke very clear. I remember her. Uh, she taught, she tested milk. And I told her my brother, told my brother about it. Oh, yes, she said. I remember the second or third time I came into the house. She came and door and she was bald head as an egg. And I told my brother, oh, yes, he said. One day when we were testing milk, she went by the fan and blew it in the, and <laughs> blew it off. She picks it up and shakes the sawdust off and puts it back. <laughs> and they used to she'd stay for breakfast afterwards. And uh, those are friendly, capable people. Well, anyway, so that's the story of the paddle. But it looks like someone used it to mixed stew or whatever. <laughs> but that's one of the, these are the things, to me, it's a very choice item. <laughs> and, uh, I, I had one other thing, I didn't bring it, but let's see. Any old thing. Well, this would be a short one, but... Look, hey, look. You don't have to pass it around, but you can, but... It's, Clothes ringer? Mm -hmm. Clothes ringer? Clothes ringer? Well, you might might ring them a little, but I don't think it was made for that. Yeah. Not quite. There you go. It's a rolling pin. I saw one. I see them for sale at a. A little bit nutty collecting. We used to go out into the middle of New York State where they had, they started a thousand dealer antique show on Route 20. A thousand dealers, and we went a couple of times. And then the farmers and others started setting up the highway. We go out, we spent two days looking. And I remember these were for sale for over $200. Wow. And uh, well, you know, the other rolling pins. They also sometimes made a, what, a villi club? It's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But this, this is kind of rare. I just picked it up recently. It's kind of a choice item. It's, it's made, it's got wooden pins in it. It's just as solid. But that's what it was made for. Let's see. Well, this is... Come on, ball. I, I took me a long time to find out what it is made for. It's along the line of this thing. That's kind of a tough one. I probably shouldn't have brought it. It's I have a collection of hooks. There were hog hooks. There were, 
hooks for hay bales, cotton bales, or the big ones, wood hooks, and so forth. That came out to be a bag hook. Apparently, they use it for bags in the probably your warehouse or where you bought feed bags for for the yeah. bread sacks. Yeah. Now here's one here. This is one I'm very interested. I wonder if someone here should know what it is. How many, how many people here worked at the wooden, at the wooden mill? At the mill here. Wooden mill. Well, I just brought that down at Creechy Gorge Antique Shop. And uh, I never bought much there, but I bought a couple things. And there was a white-haired lady at the counter. And I laid this on the counter and I said, I bet you made that, you know what that is. Surprisingly, she says, yes, I do. <laughs> and she says, I worked in a woolen mill and I used it to catch a broken thread or broken yarn. Now, is that true? Is there anybody here that would remember that? But that's the story that came with it. You don't come up with something better as well. <laughs> well, let's see. <laughs> I can't really tell some of the stories of one of them. Uh, the one with the shock in it. That was someone's going to identify that quick. Used to use it when I was in school. Yeah. 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 Is anybody here that taught music? Yes. Yeah. Teachers used to outline a five-line staff yeah. on the board. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Did you use one of them? Yeah. Oh no. But, but we had teachers in, in Woodstock that would use that. I see. Yeah. Now they come. What they come to one room school once a week or a couple? Because it brings up more about school, right? I remember, if I haven't told it already, uh, I went to Fletcher School and uh, the, my ancestors were teachers. My dad had some stories too, but for teachers, my great-grandfather, my grandfather Irwin taught school, and dad said, it wasn't easy. He said they always wanted to initiate the teacher. <laughs> and uh, he was yeah. found his hunting license after he passed away. And no, he wasn't very, he was only five foot six. And uh, one time he was in Heartland teaching and he, the kids were trying to get a barrel of flour into a kitchen. Because Dad tells him, well, Dad, his father went up and picked it up by the chimes and set it in. He had no trouble with those kids. <laughs> but uh, I remember a teacher standing up and she had a thumbtack sitting in her skirt. She had a heavy wool skirt on so it didn't prick her. <laughs> <laughs> and then all they put, put in this and snake the teacher's desk. Yeah. And uh, let's see, Fletcher School. Well, before my time, the teacher came in and had a neighbor would build the fires. And one day went in, the place was smoked up. Well, they had one unruly student in there. He'd gone up on it. He could get up on the back house on the roof. He put a bag of leaves in the chimney. She knew who did it, and they'd go out and take it out of there. And uh, I guess they had enough trouble. They transferred him somewhere else. In the story. <laughs> and uh, I remember. They used to take a, I, mean, this, I remember this happening, you take, I don't know how I mentioned the guy's name, his cousin of mine, but anyway, <laughs> they rinse a bottle, medicine bottle out of kerosene, put a cap on. And when the teacher had the boys put wood in the fire, they'd slip it in there. And finally, it'd pop, you know. And I remember the kids would be out back, you know, trying to be careful not to laugh. And, it happened. You could hear the ashes flying around that old, old oak stove. And 
the teacher opened up the door. Look, she was poking the fire. And uh, they always trying to think up something to play tricks on the teacher. The first teacher I had, Miss Copeland, and I should have brought it, but she had a tug strap about this long. And she kept it in the right top drawer of her desk. She sat in front. And uh, then she had different stages. Number one, she'd get it up and slam it on the desk. The next step was on the hand. This was a little more upset. She'd have it front and back. And uh, this guy that she had trouble with, they said she was giving it to him and he moved her hand out and she hit her knee. <laughs> well, they thought that was funny. <laughs> but I do remember her. And the one boy, she, I don't know what upset her. She laid him over a chair and did a puddle of water when he left. I don't know what the kid did, but how far would you get that nowadays? <laughs> and my granddad said my grandfather hit a kid across the face, you could still see the mark when he left school. But we were taught to respect the teachers. Now, if you come home then, I heard others say the same thing. If you didn't get along with a teacher, you got the business at home. But how, what is it like now? My granddaughter taught in Baltimore. She come to Syracuse. She said the kids swore at her and called her all kinds of names. She went to her boss. He wouldn't do a thing about it. So she kind of wants to graduate in administrative work. I guess I can see why. <laughs> well, anybody else got stories about your experiences with one room teachers? <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, we had a, a lady that taught school, and she, she was just a little bitty thing. She wasn't very tall. And one day, one of the boys just took after her, and she slammed him right onto the floor, and he <laughs> apologized, and he would, he would do anything for that teacher after he got happened. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think Jeanette or Polly can help us with this one, but I, I'm not from this area, but I, the story goes in this building, you talk about the pranks the kids played, they took a horse upstairs, <laughs> and then the teacher, they couldn't get him out, you know, but that's what, is that correct? Did somebody help me out? I think I heard it was a cow, but I didn't realize it was a school. <laughs> yeah, I think it was upstairs here. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so they did all kinds of pranks. <laughs> Well, let's see. Well, uh, this is kind of an unusual one. They can all kinds of them. That gets into another subject. Oh. Chicken feeder or something? Yeah, you got it. That's what we have. A lot of them were long with a trough or a little spinner in the middle. Because if you didn't have something in the way, they get in there and scratch the grain out. Now, how many people here had chickens? They had eggs? Eggs? You know, come back to the, I'm off on a tangent here. Uh, there's nothing like, like, uh, Homemade bread, toasted on the coals of a wood stove, with homemade butter, to serve with fried eggs, with smoked cob, cob smoked ham and bacon, or buckwheat pancakes floating in maple syrup. We ate like kings, even in the Depression. But we had chickens. We kid, as little kids. We were taught responsibility, and we had to take care of the chickens. Now, if you, Dad went out to the chicken house and found they didn't have enough grain, or they are out of water, or they are out of grit, they fed them, because they didn't have teeth, and oyster shells. We get to business. So as we grow up, we learn responsibility. We got out of high school at that time. This was World War II. You've got to get a job anywhere. They knew about what happened on the farm. And uh, I think that's one good example that we had. The kids were big enough to run around with a pail. He had a pail in his hand. 
when you were haying and it had a drag rate. He dragged up the scatterings and someone else would pitch it on. Uh, Dad, he had quite a lot of poultry. He had a hen house out back. My great grand, my grandfather Owen bought a farm I was brought up on. And you had the barns moved. They were potion bean barns, bank barns, moved from sheep farming to dairy farming. And you had it pretty efficiently. And uh, you had a hen house was out back. The carriage house was right near the end of the barn, and the horse barn was right at the end, and then there's the cattle. In the barnyard, you had it set up so you could water horses from outside. You could reach through a door in the winter to get water, and the cattle in the barnyard could, could also go in. But I remember the old hen house, Dad raised the roof up, and he had a stairway, no handrails, to go up the second floor. And we carried grain up there for years. Why we never slipped and got hurt, I don't know. OSHA wouldn't pass it now. <laughs> There's a, that little thing there, I'm very careful what I call it. This uh, no, the other, that one there. Can you see that? Some kind of a rasp? Yeah, it's a rasp. Not really. No. It's, I read in a book, yeah, they had rasp for, well, cleaning hogs or horses' hoofs when they, when they put shoes on and called woodworking. And uh, I remember read somewhere where you find a short one, you better save it because it was made for uh, rasping wood, uh, bread. Now, well, this here, I, I, found, I spent money of that in an antique shop. And uh, that was a bread rasp. Now, this one happened to be made in England, and I, a picture of one just like it in the book. But the story went that they were short, they used them to make, to, the bread oftentimes had burnt bottoms. Now, maybe cooks would know more about it. <laughs> and uh, maybe when they made them in the old ovens. But that's a story. And, uh, I worked for one all my life. I've never found one. But this is a pretty rare item. No. No. This. They made all kinds of shapes of those things. I've got a collection. I bet there's ten different styles. Uh, Well, it's a, it's a meat tenderizer. Oh. It's what it was made for. It's maybe it just used for other things. Oh, that reminds me of another story. <laughs> Bridgewater was always a special place. And uh, when Polly and I were first married, we stopped uh, to eat at her uncle's. Does anyone remember Mildred Woods? Yes. Earl. And early? Okay. We went stopped there, probably from an alumni reunion at Woodstock and headed back home. We stopped there to eat. There's only two things I remember. And number one, she had a pork roast. Oh, you could cut it with a dull fork. And the other thing was the antlers that her husband had, because those Bridgewater people were good hunters. And uh, my wife's father-in-law said, yes, sometimes you wake up in the morning and on your steps you'd find a little dish or a pail with some venison in it. But people were poor then, and they used to call it jump steak. <laughs> They're talking about jump steak, you know, that it might have got picked up some evening. <laughs> uh, well, you all grab that big thing there. Sir? Yeah, this. <laughs> The people know what that is, so no. Yeah. How many people here did logging? A lot of you fellows must have. Yeah. 
Did you use canned hook or you used a PV probably more? Well, what's a cat? Where did they get the name cat hook? Cat dog? Well, a cat is, anyone that the sawmill, of course, no. The cat is a log they sawed off four slabs. And if it's on the bed of a sawmill, they'd use a cat hook just to flip it. And that's the way it got known cat. And this was called a dog. And they came, but if you got Use a PV, a fellow named with PV up in Maine, the first one come up with the idea, they stuck a point in the end. And then that would be typical as a log roller. And uh, they must, how many people here log? There must be a number of them. It's a whole different world, isn't it? It's fun, really, I enjoy it. <laughs> Well, how many of you use a cross-cut saw? <coughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, we got five minutes. Whatever. We. I helped Dad cut wood. He cut. He had twenty cords. He figured a year to, for the sugar and then the house. He had a big house upstairs, and, and uh, we go over and cut wood four foot. And uh, the axes, you know, always have a two foot mark on them, so you can measure your log or you to, to cut every four foot. And then we cut it with first the big ones with cross cut saw. And they had I should have brought one. That little wedges they cut it up, but remember I remember well, who's the name? Otis Robinson. I talked to him, he come up and take out a few logs for me. When we come to tools in the say that our folks always, they would give us a tool for Christmas. A tool, something to wear, and maybe something to play with. Yeah, he says, and they give you an axe, and he says, if you cut yourself, you learn how not to do with it. <laughs> and uh, it was so true. And he said, I told him, yeah, he taught us how to use a tool. Well, he says, you got more work out of your tool at the same time. <laughs> but I remember cutting wood over it was, he was clearing out the beach and uh, leaving maples for sugar bush. And we remember cutting beach, and you know how slippery it is. And I remember Dad would go over and he'd take a pail, the pail he had some wedges, and he had uh, hog bristles. When they, I haven't talked about the hogs yet. And uh, the bristles, they used frogs in and, uh, Otis said, yeah, he remembered them making rods and breaking it off and putting it in the water. So when they scalded the hogs, the bristles wouldn't slip. Well, Dad used the bristles, and when you split wood and the wood's frozen, you hit the wedge and it pop out. You put the bristles around the wedge and it wouldn't. So we have an old pail with different wedges in it, and they're hog bristles, and of course you'd have an axe or two and a cross-cut saw, and Sometimes we'd take our lunch, he'd build a little fire, and we'd heat the hutch up. And those were choice days. It was fun going over there and hard work, having to cut wood. It's a lot better than doing chores, shoving <laughs> down the door. And I remember one time it started to rain, and they were freezing on. Talk about something slippery. That was slippery and fish. And we piled it up in little piles, and then when <clears throat> he did it, if it wasn't snow, but after he got the piled up, and then they'd go in with the traverse sled, fly it up and bring it in. And he'd set it up down by the woodshed where the sugar bush was. He'd have two rolls of four foot wood. And when it came time to saw it, he used a buzz saw. You people, how many remember using this cordwood saw? The buzz saw. Jeepers. <laughs> well, he had an old rig, a sawmill, a buzz saw. On the back he had the, the big saw and he always operated it. And the front he had an old one longer engine. And just probably an international, about five horse. And we set that up and it was made out of a wagon with old mowing machine wheels. And, and uh, you have, I remember Frank Barr, and he had, uh, typically you'd have two men taking the wood on, one man doing it, and then some kid would be throwing it off. And, uh, it was kind of fun. He had to help. I remember I was throwing it off once, and Frank Barr was 
there. And he says, oh, and drive that quick. <laughs> well, the stick had cow manure on the end of it. <laughs> so he always mixed up a little humor. And uh, those are the days that things have changed so much. And uh, how many more minutes we got? <laughs> Oh, the one on the end. That's the one. That's kind of an oddball. Someone near here will probably remember that. That a lot of them had a leather hinge. <laughs> Somebody must know what that is. How many people had pigs, hogs? You got, you got a number. Well, you remember when they used to dress them off? Because well, some took it to a, someone to do it. Well, that was a big day. I remember like, <laughs> sitting and having lunch. Oh, there comes Uncle George. He come to dress off the hogs. And he came up through with a Model, Model A car, and they said he never got it out of certain gear. He was my grandfather's brother, and he lived to be quite old. And uh, he lived well, my, from where I live. He come up through the yard. He had a big oval wooden top on back, and he put it at just underneath the carriage house. And Dad, he'd water up in an old iron kettle by the backyard. The only time he ever used it. And they put the water in. It had a certain temperature, and uh, they put some rosin in the water. And I forget the temperature. And then they go up and they knock a hog out and stick it. Now that sounds kind of weird, but I had a lady come in one day, she in my collection. She says, I usually didn't say much about this. And she come, oh yes, she said. She brought my attention. I did it. She says, I stick a hog. Uh, but anyway, they knock it out and we drag it out with a hog hook. And uh, they hoist it up and they flop it in the hot water. And it gets scalded, they pull it up on pulley blocks. I didn't bring a scraper. Yes. yes. They call them candlesticks. Yeah. Yeah. And this was actually an old candlestick. Yes. And then they scrape all, yes. the, all the bristles off and they'll come out just as clean and white. And then they take it out and as they hook it up, they take the insides out and their Uncle George will show us the lungs. He show us the pancreas, the heart, the liver, and be sure there's no disease. It was a better biology lesson than you'd ever get in school. <laughs> because they're, they're, so they say, like we are. And we never used the casings for hot dogs. I heard someone tell me recently they remember doing that. And then when he got done, there would be four hives, and the, the next day we'd be cutting them up in the back kitchen. Now, come on here. This is where this comes in. As we cut them up, we cut up the hams, bacon, we had salt pork, and uh, the little pieces of fat, they throw it into it as an old sugar, old fashioned sugar pan on the, on the old cook stove. And, and that would sit there and you put that in and the fat would liquefy. And then after you got done, they put it over a bucket in a cloth cotton bag. And that bag, you squeeze it up, and then you squeeze the rest of the lot out. And there are little pieces of meat mixed with it. And to come out, they called them chitlins. Yeah. Some people mix them with food or eat them like popcorn. So that's what this cheese was used, was called the lad squeezer. So that lad was like Crisco now. So they were pretty much self-sufficient. They had their own fat, and they, we had our vegetables, our fruit, we'd buy our salt and stuff like that, but, and we'd peddle our eggs. I remember going down to, <coughs> or I was probably a little guy, you go down to Bartell's store in South Woodstock. He, had a, he was also postmaster, and uh, you go up to the counter, and they'd ask for sale, they'd put it on the counter, and this and that. Jeepers, they'd add up it all in a bag. And I used to marvel how they could add. 
Now look what happens when you go through a grocery store. <laughs> We're going to change it and we've seen it in our lifetime. That's besides the fact they can't make change. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. They don't want us to write checks anymore. They want, they want to get our the numbers. Well. Did you fill up with the, the, the landfills with plastic bags? <laughs> no, they did no, no, we didn't have them then because we had to. I, but you know, when Dad went up to the woods for some reason, if he went out to pick up wood, if there was a tree blown over, that's why he dumped his tin cans. And then when the tree roots rotted out, they had a lot of dump up back old refrigerators, old farm machinery. They, <laughs> Might need a part someday. <laughs> well, it's a little, a little gadget. <clears throat> Someone asked me what that was. Well, you see a number of items like this. You open it up, they could carry it in their pocket. Oh, what? Oh, yeah. Well. Yes, don't make them today. Yeah, or a boat, a, a boat puller. Now I think I have a hoof pick here. This was, I was at the store here in Bridgewater, a lady gave this to me. I think that might have been a hoof pick, had a leather strap. It was all rusted together. I cleaned it up, and I think. That's what it was. Maybe probably there again, probably with that, that back yeah. again with the strap out where it hung it on the uh, angles. Yeah. And I wonder if they even could carry it in their pocket. But. Okay. Is this? There's an odd wrench. I don't know. I got just for all kinds of wrenches, bookie wrenches. Here's an odd ball, but it was. Does anybody have to know what it is? They might because it's made different. The story goes with it, I'm quite sure, it was made for a Yankee rake to put the tines in. Now a Yankee rake was a dump rake and had the big long tines, the horse drawn, and uh, then when you rake hay, you rake it and dump it, and then you go on and dump another roll. And then when you came time to pick it up, uh, <coughs> you go you tumble it. And they pile it, and they call it tumbling. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And uh, they tumble it so you have four tumbles, and then a grace for the horses went through. And when they pick the hay and put it on the, on the wagon, you dive down through and uh, the men would pitch it on, the kid would drive a drag rake and pick up the scatterings. And there was a whole different way of life. And when tractors came in, well, you had to get on and start it. But when you had the horses, you just said, they go. <laughs> you got to roll and stop. But you had a farm all tractor, someone had to get on and start it. <laughs> so that's the changes. Well, yeah. I think, uh Wayne Stevens has some things there. Maybe you well, could identify for yeah. one. Yeah, we're looking for. <laughs> <laughs> we'll put you to work. See what can figure out those are. <laughs> we'll get some help. <laughs> What's this? They made grub holes like that, and the hole, I think they had a handle in it to dig soil, but it's made in a shop. You see it hammered down, probably. I'd have to guess, somebody here probably. It's been around a long time. So you think it's some type of hole? Yeah, I would think so, for digging, but I've got some, the more of them are solid, but I would think it would be for digging, cultivating type of thing, but that's. That's one person's opinion. <laughs> this thing. 
Look like there's an ashes where they. Oh, I bet I. Come on, somebody doesn't know what that is. Would that have been in a fireplace? Yeah, that's in the building. And iron. Yeah. 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 Do you know what it is? Well, it's a water pump. And I. Yeah. What that? That's a boot. Well, that's heavy. Right there. Don't know. <laughs> so, so where do you go when you? Can't figure out. <laughs> <laughs> well, I go to engine shows yeah. and get stuff out, but you get all. It's interesting, people guessing like that. That makes an interesting story. Some will. There's an old timer over in New Hampshire. He went to shows when I first started fooling around with it. And he used to. His, his boy would bring him, he'd dress for the. He'd have a blanket over him. And, Gee, I had three items in the trunk, and I got him to come down and look. And he came down and he picked up one thing. I didn't bring it. He said, that's for pulling rosebud nails. The next thing he said what it was. The other one, I don't know. <laughs> and then you meet people, they look it over. Well, it might be for this, it might be for that. Try to make you think they can figure it out. And you know down well, they don't want it is. <laughs> and if it's a dealer or people, are, well, I right deal a little, you can say. And depending on the, the mood or what you thought, it was very valuable, or if they were buying, it was not very valuable. <laughs> and, but it's been, it's fun, and to me, it used to be fun buying things, trying to find things for my collection. But nowadays, when I go around, I enjoy meeting the people. You meet so many interesting people, I mean, well, you know, it's just time to, we're not bored, but if you want to end it, you get to pick the time. Well, I, we've had a great time. Well, is there any more tools here? Looks like tin. Yeah, we have one last piece here. We have yes, it looks like tin. This one? Oh, yeah. Oh, that's fun. <coughs> there's a lot of these out there, but it don't look like that. It's made of tin. It's hollow. So if you push it through something, It'll come out here. They usually don't have these fins on them. Now I've got some. I, I won't bring it. I couldn't find it. I got so much stuff. It was apparently, I think, an apple core. And the short ones, they had a little hole in the side, and you push them out. But this one, apparently, it was made to a quarter. You could take the core out and quarter the apple at the same time. You don't think sausage, though? Pardon me? Sausage. What? Sausage. I don't really know. I almost doubt it. But I never say never. Yeah. Yeah, here's, here's one I didn't. This, well, it's a multi-tool. What was it made for? What did they use it for? <laughs> It's got a handle, put it in, you can go. You see, uh, I got a number of them. Some of them are pretty, pretty neat. Okay. You could pick up a, you could open a can with it. And this unique part, the only one I ever see, you pick up a dish like this. That's, and it says so in the book. And then this was for a griddle. Pick up a griddle on a stove. Oh, that makes sense. And you could pick up an iron kettle bale with this part. But I was going to tell about stoves, but I already told the story about the stoves. But I, I never, I never get over the feeling of a mother's the work that they did. Here they were in a different world. They made one kid, and you have trouble bringing them up. Then they had, I got a neighbor, she's 94 years old. I interviewed her for, her brother died in service. I interviewed her for her brother, 
and talked about her life. And her one remark she said, her father was not too well. She said, you don't work, you don't eat. <laughs> and she was a little preemie. Dr. Eastman said, you never make it. Her mother fed her with a, with a medicine droplet. And she made it. And she's the only one in the family living. She's two years older than I am. <laughs> and I think she only weighed a pound or two. It's, a, it's amazing how some people make it. But you, you learn from each other. Well, we are here. Let's do this in. I'm kind of crazy, you know. You know, you take people that collect. I think they're a little injection or eccentric. How many people here collect? I forgot to ask that. Okay. Now, some collect teacups. I know a lady out in New York. She comes, they start to come to visit with them. She has a border around her kitchen, all teacups. What an interesting thing. And some people collect thimbles. Of course, I collect farm stuff. Now, you know, the farmers did so many things that you would have it wide open. I collect uh, starters. Darners? Dark darners? Darky darners, right. I got a bunch of them. We ought to get yeah. together sometime. <laughs> <laughs> I got some extra ones. <laughs> but the work the women did, you did the sewing. My wife, she still, I guess her dress is gone now. She made her own dresses when she was a kid. She changed the diapers on her younger brother. That's what the girls did. When they got out of school, they knew how to make a living. How many neighbors, ladies now know how to take care of a baby? Unless they had, had youngest brothers or sisters. Whole different world. They did the cooking, they cleaned the house, they helped wallpaper it. Remember, they cleaned the paint off for fly specks every periodically, <laughs> as well as do all the cooking and washing. Remember? You can't remember. Monday, Sunday night, especially in the winter, the wash tubs would come out. In the morning, she'd have two batches done, and for breakfast cooked when we went to school. And Tuesday, Monday was washing. Tuesday, they did the ironing. Was Wednesday sewing? Saturday was baking. Tuesday sewing. They had their own, their own system. I mean, the word, uh, ladies work, men's work was sun to sun, ladies work was never done. <laughs> <laughs> and the farm, you know, it was, the work was right on oh, Jesus. The work was right on your doorstep. You didn't have to take a dinner pay and go to work. And uh, it was a whole different way of life. And I think I was fortunate being brought up that way. And school was not my cup of tea. I'd rather work for dad than go to school. And I'd come back up after school and you'd hear the old engine talking out there, feeling silent, and I couldn't wait to get up there. Yeah, how many people remember the hurricane of 38? Okay. Well, my dad had six acres of corn. Typically they had five, six acres of corn. And that year they picked their, they had to cut their horn all the corn back. He used to have a little forage harvester he pulled by on the horses. But nowadays, if you're a grandson's farmer, they aren't happy if they aren't cut 35 acres in a day. Dad, he'd get it cut, and uh, he used to fill silo. He had four or five was what he could handle. And he started down the dooryard, I remember. He had an old iron wheel wagon. The horses would tear the wagon, and they'd grind in the gravel. On top was this pipes, and then you had the, the corn blower, and on that you had a power plant. And uh, he got rid of the old one longer, and uh, I don't know if people remember Clyde Wood, the big Carl Woods fan, I don't see Carl here. And he used to help remodel old trucks, cars for doodle bugs. And Dad brought in, from down to, I can't think of the name, toward Woodstock, an old Oldsmobile, I think it was a 1913 or 15. And I, I, I steered it, and he dragged it up with a chain, but it run up. And they took and they shortened that thing, no, ti no tires, just two rims, and they hooked it up with a pulley with the end of, of the engine by their clutch, and uh, 
he had it rigged up, so he put the blower up, and then he tacked that old power plant, the old automobile engine up, and uh, you push the clutch in, held it with both, and then when they got the belt on it, they slowly they take, let the clutch out, and that would take the place the old one longer. And they had, they had a throttle on it. No, Clyde was pretty clever. Dale probably remembers him. For a governor, he had a little blade. So when the, the engine ran faster, the blade would move and that would adjust the carburetor. So if it slowed down, the carburetor would open up. And they run that for a few years. But oh, when I come back from service, they were all gone. The horses were gone, we had a tractor. So, uh, there's been a lot of changes out there. Well, I, anything else? Yeah. Yes, I used to go up in, uh, in the summer to visit my grandparents, and uh, I always wanted to milk the cow. <laughs> and he said, no, you can't milk cows because if you're a young lady, it will hurt your wrist. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> well, maybe there's some truth in that. <laughs> that was a whole different way of life. Well, I say it's been a challenge, and I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to do this. Because I, I don't do this.